<sighs> Hi guys. I think that students don't understand that when it's final season for them, that is also final season for teachers. Yeah, I too am looking forward to the end of the semester. I'm gonna take some naps. I can't wait. Get it together, Hong. You can do this. Ugh. All right, guys, welcome to design process video number five. Today, we're working on shapes and proportions. The last couple of videos, I was throwing a lot of color theory at you. I was throwing a lot of fabric knowledge at you. This video is not going to be so much as throwing information at you as it is kind of just showing you a few techniques that I show students and I use myself when I start designing. Because yes, we are going to start designing stuff now, okay? We uh, figured out our mood board and figured out our concepts and you know did our visual research and we pulled our color story and figured out our proportions and our season and then we pulled fabrics and created this sort of mood with our fabrics and our colors and our visuals and now we're gonna actually think about clothes so we're not focusing so much on design details and construction and little tiny rows of top stitching, but more about shapes and proportions. You can go look up vocabulary words for silhouettes and explore like classic silhouettes of coats, classic silhouettes of dresses. I do have a few videos in my Fashphobitic Fashion Vocabulary Video Dictionary playlist. And I know there are a couple of requests for more. I have a, a request for a bridal vocabulary and how to and one on shoes that are in the queue and they will come when they come. I don't know. There's a calendar. Let me know if you want more vocabulary dictionary uh, videos and if, you, if there are particular subjects that you want me to focus on. And so you can go and look up things like classic coat silhouettes and classic dress silhouettes, but you don't need to. You know, if you can just play without having a concrete understanding of the vocabulary. Like I make the vocabulary videos because it's important for you, for you guys to understand the vocabulary that your future bosses and employees and your coworkers will be using to communicate with you, but you don't need to know them to design things. Some people design off of the mood of their concept boards. Okay, they're very mood driven. Some people are really inspired by music, a specific song or a few different songs. Um, and so you can take that and run with it and be like, okay, so I'm inspired by this movie. It's got this really sad, somber, moody tone to it. And so what kinds of shapes reflect that mood. Are they perky little ruffles made out of eyelet? Okay. Are they long sweeping drapes? Okay. Are they sexy geometric cutouts at the waist? Okay. There are different moods associated with different shapes. Okay. And so if you think about it, it's like, yeah, there are certain things that look more sad, somber, serious and so you would pursue those shapes think about if you're inspired by a song think about hey what if i were doing the music video for this how would i style it not necessarily like design each and every costume but what kind of kinds of clothes would you start thinking about pulling for like a general wardrobe feel for the music video you know reflect back on you know, your original concept, your original customer, like my customer is super sexy and sassy and young. Like, okay, what are these shapes? And you know, my customer is really androgynous. And so what are those kinds of shapes? Probably not a lot of like fit and flair, you know, waist emphasis, cleavage emphasis, right? More androgynous. 
So think about your customer, think about the mood of your concept board, and think about, you know, how those things play together. Some people like to take their shapes directly from visual research. So I have me with me today my, my sketchbook. Remember, I created these pages during the concept board video. I have some other extra images that, you know, I didn't get around to doing in the video or in subsequent videos, but if I were working on this project on my own, I would have used cutout and collaged in subsequent pages in my sketchbook. But I retained these images for today's demo. I have my window tool. Okay, remember, I love using my window tool to pull shapes. Okay, so that you're not just looking at the overwhelming entire picture, but looking at them in terms of shapes. So that I'm thinking about this, not as an arm, but as a shape. And then I have croquis, and I have croquis that I have printed in different sizes and in different views, you know, uh, front, back, side, front, side, okay, really big. Pretty dang small. I have some tracing paper and I have scissors, glue, pencil, and the marker colors that correspond to my color story that I did in the color video. For me, this is the fun stage. This is where you just play around, okay? This is not about finding perfect armholes, okay? We're just playing around. We're doing like a big brain dump. One method I like to use is to just trace shapes that are happening in my visuals. And then I like to take my croquis and I like to lay it on there and play with the shape play with how this shape looks on a larger figure, play with how this shape looks on a smaller figure. I don't have to just keep this shape. Maybe I want to Maybe I want to play with that. Maybe that's a proportion I prefer. You can go back to your original collage work. And then play with them as style lines. Another approach is to color in blocks using your color story. And play with that. And then take another sheet of tracing paper and develop this coming around and maybe this is wrapping, this is coming around, connecting like this. And that's coming around the back. And that's the rest of your gown, the rest of her gown sitting in there like that. So you've gone from piecing random hair shapes out of marker to developing potential shapes for a dress, a cape, style lines, wrapping around. You can also cut out your shapes. I mean, something like this, you could cut out pretty much any sort of configuration of emeralds. You can cut out a very strange shape. Lay them on a small croquis like this. 
lay them on a large croquis like this. And the effect will be different because you're playing with the scale. It will also be different if you lay it down on a side figure. That creates one kind of shape. And then laying it on a side or back figure creates a different kind of shape. Maybe you're more interested in something like that. You can twist things around. Maybe you have falling giant coat long in the back, giant sleeve thing happening. Instead of side seams, you have strange, interesting wrapping seams coming around. So it's not a matter of following this shape exactly. I mean, that's a rather bizarre garment if you're going to follow that shape exactly. But to take the inspiration from that and transfer that and work with it and, you know, let the mood kind of follow with the shapes, with your customer and the feel for everything and kind of let that merge together as you build a design off of your shapes. You could cut out all of these shapes, like little clusters of these emeralds and then start collaging them onto your figures. You, know, you can take your images and cut them out in different ways. You know, your Remember, your visual research images are inspiration. They're not to dictate how you're going to use them. Just because something is a shape, it doesn't mean, oh, I must follow this shape precisely. I'm kind of using the main veins of these leaves as a guide, but I'm going to use them however I want because I'm the boss. I'm the designer, yo. Or see now I'm doing this and I'm reminded of that creepy photo of the moth that I had in the, the second video where we're talking about the mood board and there was that crazy moth and I was like, ugh, this where I could create a cape that's really inspired by, you know, shifting platelets. Right? So I could start thinking about you know, collaging these together and pulling on the insect imagery, creating platelets, collaging these things together, you know, creating a coat like this. Okay? There are lots of things that you can do. You don't always have to just work in the 2D. Some of you are more 3D minded. And for those of you who are not so 3D minded, you know, maybe you are more 2D minded and you're working here, but then you get stuck and you get pissed. And so maybe you need to break out of your rut and go play on a different medium. And so go get some yardage of muslin. Muslin is cheap. Or you can get some yardage of some other cheap material and start pinning things on the mannequin. You know, pin things that reflect your mood, that reflect some of these shapes that are going on. You know, you could like ball up paper into these giant spheres and start sticking them to your mannequin and collaging them in different ways. And then take pictures of everything and print them out and put them in your book. And again, like if you drape something that looks awesome in the front, take a picture of it, catalog it. That doesn't mean you have to use it as a front. Again, you could use it like your visual research where you cut that drape out and then, you know, use it upside down, use it sideways, what have you. You can also hit a thrift store and buy some ready-made garments and take them apart and put them back together again. This is an, a little exercise that I encourage my beginner students to explore, especially 
Not that one is ever too advanced to not study garment construction, but especially for the beginners who don't understand garment construction to go look at more clothes. You know, go find some dollar shirts, button downs at a thrift shop, take it apart, figure out how it was constructed, put them back together again in weird ways. That doesn't mean that your collection has to look like deconstructed garments, but again, use that as an inspiration, as a springboard to create different garments. This is another old school technique, but sometimes, you know, people really want to visualize their fabric on the body and that really helps them design. And so some people like to take scraps of their fin their actual final fabric and lay it down on the figure and play with it in this way. Maybe I want to create this with this really cool textured thin knit and create something that's long and sleeveless and drapey. Anytime you come up with anything cool, just snap it with your camera phone, document it for later. Maybe I wanna play with, you know, maybe this is how you visualize things, okay? Everyone, I mean, most people in fashion, we are visual learners, we're visually, you know, set in our ways we are the most sensitive visually but even within those parameters we all think a little bit differently maybe something like that so yeah play around with little bits of fabric on your croquis and it might be a little bit easier if your croquis was a little bit bigger than this because some of these fabrics can get a little bit bulky especially if you're designing for fall winter but that is also a fun and tried and true method designers have used over the years. And keep in mind, not every shape that you develop has to be the overall silhouette of the garment. It can be a cool shape for a pocket. It can be a cool shape just for the sleeve or the collar or just one section of your garment. So play with that as well. The shapes that you create, it can be a pattern for color blocking. It can be a direction of different seam lines. You know, not everything has to have a side seam. It can also inspire you to develop a print off of this. Like maybe you didn't think that this was an interesting print, but maybe when you're looking at it to scale, like now this is so much bigger in proportion to the body that it looks much more interesting as a print to you now. So be open to all of these concepts. I encourage you guys to document your mistakes. Mistakes in quotes. I actually really dislike people who do finger quotes. And sometimes I catch myself doing it in class. I'm like, ooh, don't do that. Stop doing that. I encourage you to document mistakes because you know what? Our our opinions on what's cool changes all the time. You know that infamous Oscar Wilde qu quote about fashion being so ugly that we have to change it every six months? And then there's that whole industry adage, you know, everything cycles back at once every 20 years. The 70s are back in style. Stuff we thought was ugly before is really hot now and vice versa. And even on a smaller scale, maybe you were doing something and playing around and you didn't like it and maybe you'll like it later. Maybe you don't like it as is, but later on it inspires you to do something else with it. Maybe it is seriously the worst thing that has ever happened to fashion and you just need to remind yourself to never do that again. Whatever it is, I encourage you guys to document things that are not working as well as the things that are working. Also, you know, I'll talk to students and, you know, they'll tell me stories like, oh, yeah, Zoe, I, I scribbled that and, you know, I was talking to my teacher and I hated it, but she was like, oh, my God, that's amazing. And I was kind of like, huh, huh, okay. Because sometimes that happens. Proportions. So proportions are basically how big something is compared to something else. And... 
you need to learn how to play with proportions to get the effect that you want. Some of the proportions that you play with will reflect the attitude of the garment. For example, you can have a slim fitting dress. Okay, and maybe you have this waist. How does that look compared to, again, yeah, same dress, but I'm gonna give her a really short skirt. And so by changing the proportion of the skirt, how does that affect the overall look? A lot of proportions involves where you put the waistline of things. And so if you have something strapless and then you have an ampere, what is that mood and how does it change from that to something that is hips long? It's the same dress, simple on the top with a couple of little bust starts and then your skirt is lots of gathers, but what is the age and vibe and attitude of something with a very high waist versus something with a really low waist? Okay, so you're gonna play with the proportions, you know, how long the hems are, where the waist sits, things like that, to create the attitude that you want for your clothes. You can play with proportions in the length of things. I was having a conversation with a student this past week about Celine and how, you know, much of that brand, a lot of their shapes are very long. They don't have little short skirts. They have long maxi coats, long midi maxi skirts, you know, uh, long pants and they're not very tightly fitted to the body, okay, much more relaxed. And we had this really great conversation about how these long relaxed looks, how they reflect the designs, the attitude of the brand and the kind of customer that is attracted to Celine. Okay. So think about who you want to dress. Think about your visual research and the mood that you're trying to convey. And think about what kind of proportions on the body and to each other will help you convey your message. So think about wide and long versus short and skinny. Think about long and skinny versus wide and long. You also wanna think about proportions with features. Now, again, we're not gonna go into nitty gritty details about all the little construction things, but you know, if you're designing like say a safari jacket with big prominent pockets, you have to think about how the proportions of those pockets are going to affect the overall design. One of my number one uh, things, pet peeves, whatever you want to call it in my illustration class, is whenever people draw back view pants. You know, I have students who come in and they draw these jeans. They draw these little pockets. Oh my God, no, no, no. Okay, teeny tiny little pockets like that make the entire garment look cheap. They look totally like straight up Santi Alley, got them for $12 and I picked all the rhinestones off. Oh my God, no. Traditional jeans have a yoke in the back for fit. And that's how you fit over the curves of your butt without darts. Jeans with darts looks kind of not jeansy. And then your pockets are large enough to fit your whole hand or your boyfriend's hand, or your girlfriend's hand. And the top of your pocket will be parallel to that center back yoke. This is a more high-waisted look, but look at how the proportions of the pocket on the butt of this, I use the same figure to draw both these pants, so you know that her butt is the same size, but look at how the proportions of the pockets really changes the look of the whole garment. Let's be real, when was the last time you went shopping for pants and didn't check out your own ass? Nobody buys pants that doesn't make their butt look good.
So think about the effect of a tiny collar on your garment versus a much bigger collar. Think about proportions and color blocking. Okay? Do I want big giant shapes and what does that look like versus you know much smaller checks? Or maybe thinking in terms of your future print, like, oh, maybe I want a rose print. Okay, I'm really feeling like I want a watercolor print with beautiful roses. It's like, what's it going to look like if I have a print with lots of teeny tiny roses all over versus what's it going to look like if I have a print with really big roses all over or in between, or maybe I'll have both. Okay, play with that. A lot of designers design with the body and figure flattering clothes in mind. And so you might want to think, okay, how do I create style lines and styles that flatter the figure? Turn of the century designs where, oh, not this past century, the century before that. Turn of the 20th, 19th to 20th century, a lot of the styles were about this incredibly tiny waist emphasis. And to make waist look even smaller, the fashion of the day was to make the sleeves even bigger so that the big sleeves and the big bust would make their waist look even smaller than those corseted waists actually were. Okay? So think about how you can make certain things bigger to make other things look smaller and vice versa. All right, now that I've shown you some techniques to get you started, go out and explore and play. Don't take things too literally, but let your visual research be a source of inspiration and not something that you copy directly onto your garment. Okay, Let your mind wander and kind of let all your different visual research images come together and coalesce. I remember uh, in a previous video I said that I could all give you guys the same direction, the same visual research images and you know you guys would all come up with something different because your brains translate the same information in different ways and you would combine them in different ways. So go and have fun and let your brain translate them in its own unique way. Try putting things on mannequins, try collaging things on top of each other, okay? Play with your window tool. And yeah, if you tend to default to certain methods, okay, maybe you need to try some of the other methods that I mentioned. You know, shake your brain up a little bit so you're not stuck in a rut. Again, all this process, this development, you know, it's really all about making sure you're not just churning out the same crap season after season. There's a big difference between making sure that your brand is cohesive and everything looks like it's, it's still true to you versus just turning out the same crap over and over and over again have fun. Remember, this is the fun, the good stuff, right? The, you know, for designers, this is where the juicy part starts a little bit, you know? Like, I like the other stuff too. Don't get me wrong. Like, I am not complaining about that, but this is kind of where the, the real fun starts, right? Okay. So go have fun as usual. If you have a question, check the info box. If it's not there, leave me a comment below. Uh, design process video six is coming and uh, hit the subscribe button. Wait, if you want an alert for that, go have fun, explore, and I will see you next time.